When God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was complete chaos, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light, and God saw the light was good, and God separated the light from darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness God called night. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome, and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky. And God said, Let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together God called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seeds of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly over the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves, of every kind, with which the waters swarm, and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. So God created humans in God's image. In the image of God, God created them. Male and female, he created them. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with a seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything has a breath of life. I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that God made, and indeed, it was very good. It was all very good. On this Earth Day Sunday, we just heard in the scripture, and we were reminded that embedded and proclaimed by God, the creator world, created world, which includes human beings, is good. God's creation, the unfolding and evolution of nature, is good. But not only good, but very good. In Genesis, the creation myth, however, it doesn't take long for all of God's human creation to start causing trouble in and out of the garden. And when God is attributed as saying, and this is in the scripture, let us make humans in our image according to our likeness, 
and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth, we can see how at this very early stage of human consciousness, there is an emerging attitude of separateness, a developing monotheistic perspective that elevates the human value above the value of the created world. And human superiority begins to take root. And eventually, in later eras, this attitude of dominion, domination, gets interpreted as that of superiority, the right to subjugate creation and creatures, to exploit the fruits of God's earth and even other human beings who are considered inferior. This one ancient scripture has shaped many generations of people to interpret this as a God-likeness, as humans have this God-likeness, and they internalize this instead of a relatedness to a kind of self-God-ordained authority. And it still shapes how human beings understand themselves in relation to God and the larger created world. And in this worldview, humans become separate and exalted above the rest of nature instead of being embedded and related to God's created order and world. God becomes an entity and an authority outside of nature instead of moving within and among and around us. And the tendency for human beings is to lose their sense of relatedness to God, to lose their sense of humility. And this is ancient, but it's as bad as it ever was. One way to understand these stories is to view them as myths. Instead of taking, some people have taken the Bible literally, but these myths actually tell us something about the development of humankind. Myths are ancient stories that reflect the embedded patterns that belong to the human family and in nature. And different cultures have different myths. They reflect a particular cultural, religious, and psychological process that was present. And they give us meaning, a sense of belonging, and they tell us a story about where we come from. Sometimes they give us a revelation of where we have erred, but also an image of who we can be, who we are called to be. And in our ancient origin story by, in Genesis, the Adam and Eve, the creation story, uh, the trouble starts pretty early on. You have Adam and Eve asserting their own authority, getting in trouble, and getting kicked out of the garden. That's just in chapter 3. <laughs> and then in Genesis 4, you have the rise of brother against brother. It's a tragic story of Cain killing Abel. And again, if we look at this mythologically, it represents this clashing, a jealousy between opposing attitudes and belief systems, a pursuit of power over instead of with. And if we want to interpret this for today and throughout our history, we see nations going against nations, right? Religion against religion, race against race. The, and the myth of the brother against the brother is found in every culture, in every religion. And don't we all have a sense of our own inner conflict at times, our own inner battles, like two different things going against each other? We want to be more than we are, but we feel trapped where we are. Have you ever felt like that? And then the story goes on. In Genesis 6, we read the words, The Lord saw the wickedness of humans was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continuously. Right? This is just chapter 6. 
And the Lord was sorry that he made humans on the earth, and it grieved his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the humans I have created, people together with animals and creeping things, and birds of the air, for I am sorry I have made them. And though these are ancient myths, they tell us sadly, we haven't changed too much. And with Noah, though, God gives humanity and nature another chance. Again, that's this story that keeps continuing. And it seems to be in the nature of God to keep bringing forth, to keep giving birth, to keep resurrecting new life and new possibility out of that which seems dead. You know, with baby Jesus, God kind of gives us another chance to see God's own incarnation and to show us the way of love and justice and mercy. But what can this mean for us today when we have wandered so far away? Haven't we too become separated and disconnected? How many feel that way at times? Gus Speth, who helped found the Natural Resource Defense Council and was the dean of the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, told a British radio, this is back in 2013, I used to think that the top global environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that with 30 years of good science, we could address these problems. But I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. One of the paramount issues in our culture and our world today is the loss of the sense of the sacredness and relatedness to the world. Philosopher David uh, Fedler writes, we have the greatest technological knowledge of any civilization, but we have forgotten what it means to be alive in the world, to be alive in a living universe. Yet without this living connection to the world, our lives become trivial, routine, mechanical. And he asserts that the remedy is threefold. A real felt sense of our bond with the transcendent order of which we are part. We have to work at that. We have to connect to nature. He has a vision of living nature and an appreciation of nature's intelligence. Uh, we've done many programs around how amazing nature is. Um, the intelligence embedded in creatures, in nature, the sharing of resources, even with plants. And then he says an ethical concern for society based on our intrinsic kinship with the other. Now this type of remedy takes a conversion of sorts. And this morning, I don't have an easy answer. But just to affirm for all of us to reconnect, to stay connected, and remember that God declared it was all very good. And I think we can focus on the all very bad. And perhaps there is a smidgen of hope as each of us holds close to that truth. And good does not mean that every outcome will be good for us personally. We get sick, accidents happen, people do bad things, the earth shakes, floods come. We will all die. But the fact that we have breath and exist and have conversations 
and love and cry and fear and experience is truly miraculous. Mary Oliver, in one of her essays, said, I would say that there exists a thousand unbreakable links between each of us and everything else, and that our dignity and our chances are one. The farthest star and the mud at our feet are a family. And there is no decency or sense in honoring one thing or a few things than closing the list. The pine tree, the leopard, the Platte River, and ourselves. We are at risk together or we are on our way to a sustainable world together. We are each other's destiny. And God saw that it was all very good. Alfred North Whitehead said, God is in the universe or nowhere, creating continually in us and around us. This creative principle is everywhere, in animate and so-called inanimate matter, in the ether, water, earth, human hearts. And so far as we partake of this creative process, do we partake of the divine, of God. And Carter Hayward brings us back to Genesis. And she puts it this way. In the beginning, long before there was any idea of God, something stirred. And in that cosmic moment, pulsating impossibility, God breathed into space and groaning in passion, in pain, and hope gave birth to creation. But it was good. It was far better than we can imagine for coming forth from God, in God, with God, by God, we were shaped by God in God's own image. Formed in the being of God, daughters and sons of God. It was very, very good. For being created meant being with God. Now, Carter's quote reminds us of how interconnected we are with God. Whitehead's quote, Mary Oliver's passage. But I suspect in reality, most of us, our lived reality and experience of God is not so connected. In some ways, it seems like we have returned to the time of Noah on that brink. We can't change the whole world. But on this Earth Day Sunday, we are beckoned to restore our connection with God, with nature, with our brothers and sisters, to do what we can, to trust that God is still a living God, and there is good. Creation is good. And if God ever saw that creation was good, then it is still good. Let us this day take our own sense of responsibility and privilege that we have to take care of this garden. Let us return to the garden on this day. Amen.